whole soul with tears for the conversion of the heathen world to the service of Jesus and for every personal domestic need, we felt as if in the presence of the living Savior and learned to know and love him as our divine friend. Now, there was one scene. Let me recreate it for you and then let him describe it. And this is the most moving scene in the book for me. And there were many moving scenes in this book. He's now in his early 20s. I wish I knew exactly how old and he's going to leave Thorowald for the first time and go to Glasgow. Glasgow's a long way. It's 40 miles to the train station. You've got to walk it. You don't know when your son will come back from the big city. He's going to go to divinity school. He has this mission impulse within him. He may stay there. We may not see him. We're, we're older. We may die. We don't know. My, my dear father walked with me the first six miles of the way. His counsels and tears and heavenly conversation on that parting journey are fresh in my mind as if it had been but yesterday. He's an old man writing this. And tears are on my cheeks as freely now as then whenever memory steals me away to the scene. For the last half mile or so, we walked on together in almost unbroken silence. My father, as was often his custom, carrying hat in hand while his long flowing yellow hair, then yellow, but in later years white as snow, streaming like a girl's down over his shoulders. His lips kept moving in silent prayers for me and his tears fell fast when our eyes met each other in looks for which all speech was vain. We halted on reaching the appointed parting place. He grasped my hand firmly for a minute in silence and then solemnly and affectionately said, God bless you, my son. Your father's God prosper you and keep you from all evil. Unable to say more, his lips kept moving in silent prayer. In tears, we embraced and parted. I ran off as fast as I could. And when about to turn a corner in the road where he uh, would lose sight of me, I looked back and saw him still standing with head uncovered where I had left him gazing after me, waving my hat Ado, I rounded the corner and out of sight in an instant. But my heart was too full and sore to carry me further. So I darted into the side of the road, wept for a time. Then, rising up cautiously, I climbed the dike to see if he yet stood where I left him. And just at that moment, I caught a glimpse of him climbing the dike and looking out for me. He did not see me, and after he gazed eagerly in my direction for a while, he got down, set his face toward home, and began to return. His head still uncovered, and his heart, I felt sure, still rising in prayers for me. I watched through blinding tears till his form faded from my gaze, and then hastening on my way, and here was the line, vowed deeply and oft by the help of God to live and act so as never to grieve or dishonor such a father. You, you talk about what was happening on Tana and by the graveside of his wife and through the thousands of difficulties in his life. And what was happening was the fruit of a father's love. I, I, I almost gave this lecture totally on that father-son relationship because there's enough there just to unpack it for us in terms of how he prayed. He talked about they had to walk six miles to church. His father missed church twice in 42 years. Never in his memory missed a family devotion. Everything gave way. I think of myself, and if, if Barnabas says, oh, I'm late for school, Dad. I say, 
Well, at least let's pray. What a wimp! <laughs> Sit down. You can be late for school. <laughs> they never miss. This, you got to be Scotch to do that, right? <laughs> the six miles. This kid and his ten brothers and sisters, he said, looked forward to going and coming because the meat at the temple was so rich, they were eager to get there, and it was so rich it took six miles to digest it on the way home. And he said, religion was presented to me with such an intellectual freshness. That was the phrase, intellectual freshness, that the Lord's Day was never boring in the Patton home. Oh, what an impact the home will have. Number two, um, his courage came from a deep sense of divine calling. Before he was 12, he said he knew God wanted him to be a foreign missionary, though he put it on the shelf for a long time. When he was criticized, you shouldn't go, this is crazy. Then his parents stepped forward. And this is what they said. Heretofore, we feared to bias you, but now we must tell you why we Praise God for the decision to which you have been led. Your father's heart was set upon being a minister, but other claims forced him to give it up. When you were given to them, your father and mother, this is his father writing this, your father and mother laid you upon the altar, their firstborn, to be consecrated, if God saw fit, as a missionary of the cross. And it has been their constant prayer that you might be prepared, qualified, led to this very decision. And we pray with all our heart that the Lord may accept your offering, long spare you, and give you many souls from the heathen world for your hire. Thank God for parents, right? Thank God for parents. Number three, a third source, courage came from a sense of the holy heritage of his church. He was the heir of the blood of martyrs among the Scottish Covenanters, and he knew it. And he said, I am more proud that the blood of martyrs is in my veins and their truths in my heart than other men can be of noble pedigree or royal names. And when he talked about truths, he meant Calvinism. And he says so explicitly on page 195, I am by conviction a strong Calvinist. And then he unpacks it in the way true Calvinists really unpack it, who are missionaries, and the best Calvinists are missionaries, and non-missionary Calvinists are not true Calvinists. He said, regeneration is the sole work of the Holy Spirit in the human soul and heart and is in every case one and the same. Conversion, on the other hand, bringing into play the action of the human will also, get the order here now, is never absolutely the same, perhaps in any two souls, Oh, Jesus, to thee alone be all the glory. Thou hast the key to unlock every heart whom thou hast created. That's what kept him going theologically in the hardest places of the world. Calvinism is not a hindrance to missions. It's the only hope for missions. And anything else is a distortion of it. And if you call yourself a Calvinist, or somebody who loves the supremacy of God, and you aren't hard after the unreached peoples, you're a living contradiction. And many of the great missionaries, Duff and Judson and Carey and Patton, the whole wave of the first modern missionary movement would put you to shame for talking about Calvinism apart from missionary reaching the unreached peoples. Fourth thing that prompted his courage, besides the truths of these covenanters that he loved, was the sovereignty of God controlling all of his adversities. What about his wife and child? 
feeling 